Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast with hosts Amy Babinchek, James Kernan, and Carl Polachek. Produced by Kernan Consulting and for the international MSP community, we are dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. Today's SMB Community Podcast is brought to you by Huntress Managed Security. Cybersecurity isn't just about software, it's about expertise. Huntress boasts the number one rated endpoint detection and response for small and medium-sized businesses on G2. Trust us to keep your system secure. With a 99% customer satisfaction score, our support team is second to none. We're not just a vendor, we're your partners on the security front line. Ready to experience the future of cybersecurity? Start your trial now at Huntress.com slash Carl. Don't wait. Lock down your defenses today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the SMB Community Podcast. This is James Kernan with Kernan Consulting Live here with my good friend, Miss Amy Babinchek. Hey, Amy. Good hey, morning. James. Good morning. How are, how are things up in the uh, Michigan area? Uh, we had a, a brief spell of winter. But um, we seem to be getting over it. Uh, you know, it never fails that the first of spring means we're going to get some snow. And um, that's what that's what Mother Nature did. I actually had to grab out the snow blower, which is funny because I used it once previously all winter. Oh, no. And then um, I, you know, filled it up with gas in anticipation I would use it again. I hadn't used it since. So um, it's actually it's kind of fun to get out there with the snow blower, but. You know, those those freaky Midwest uh, spring winter storms, you know, can, you know, there's always seemed to be one or two of them. But yeah, there's a big one as we are recording this now. Uh, there's a big one hitting or, or has hit the, the Midwest. I know northern Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, and then Minnesota got about uh, eight inches of snow, uh, I think, as we speak. So I know it's disrupting some travel. So hopefully our listeners are not caught up into that. Um, I've got an event later this week, so I'd already heard from a couple people that they may be delayed. So I'll keep my fingers crossed that none of you guys are affected by that. What What is your event? Why don't you tell us about that event now? Yeah, I'm excited. So uh, uh, partly because it's, it's cool now, that storm pushed some cold weather south and uh, I'm gonna be gone most of this week, <laughs> but I leave <laughs> tomorrow for Austin, Texas. We'll have the uh, quarterly mastermind live at the Ninja One headquarters in Austin, Texas. So uh, Thursday, Friday, March 28th, 29th. Uh, we're trying to make it a lot of fun where it's more of an experience of our strategic partners and then also the local city. You know, Austin, Texas has a lot to offer. So that should be fun. I've got some great speakers lined up. Uh, M&A is a big topic. We're going to talk about lead gen, you know, sales, marketing. Uh, EOS is another big topic. Uh, and then cybersecurity, of course. So uh, uh, anyway, it's a two-day event, March 28th, 29th. We do those every quarter. And if you miss this one, uh, we'll be doing one in Clearwater Beach, Florida for Q2. And I'm still trying to twist my friend's arm, Amy, here to come speak at the event because I always love her presentations. But uh, anyway, hopefully I can sweet talk you into that uh, here late June. Uh, we'll be back in Florida. So that, right. that should be fun. I will. I'll take a look at my arm and I'll let you know. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it's quite quite likely. So it'd be fun to to get awesome. get down there to Florida again. All right. So, hey, we had a really cool question of the week, and we've danced around this topic before, but I think it's the question really is in a different sense. And I don't think we've addressed this, but the question of the week came in, should we force remote workers to start coming to the office? So should we force remote workers to start coming into the office? And and to me, I, I read it as, you know, five days a week, you know, Monday through Friday, eight to five. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I hate the word force for one yeah, thing. I agree. <laughs> uh, anytime you have to, yeah, anytime you have to force your employees to do something, um, they're going to be unhappy. Right. So, you know, I would, 
I, I would I would try to do something differently. I've seen some studies recently talk, you know, looking address, addressing this issue. Um, and, you know, and mainly they're looking at large companies when they're when they're doing this, but they're wondering, you know, when you call people back to the office 100% of the time, like, well, you know, but in the last three years really is about how long it's been. Mm -hmm. They've arranged their, their life differently. They've gotten new habits developed. Um, and to snatch that back away, will will make them, will make them unhappy. And yeah. I think, you know, you and I both agree. I think that a hybrid approach seems to be the easiest one for businesses to manage because when yeah. everybody is remote, there's a culture issue potentially. Mm -hmm. At least you have to work harder at your business culture. And that is something yeah. that a lot of managers are really bad at. Uh, and so that's a that's an issue to be concerned. But, you know, I would to the questioner, I would flip it around a little because one of the things that is uh, easy for small businesses to do, it's valuable to employees, it doesn't cost us a whole lot of money, are benefits. Yeah. And, you know, hybrid work is a benefit. And so, you know, that's a that's a, an advantage that your business can tout, you know, that your employees enjoy a remote, you know, some remote work experience that they have flex time, uh, you yeah. know, things things like that drive uh, it, those those benefits mean things to people and they build loyalty to your business. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great way to you know, you, you've phrased it perfectly. It is a benefit. It's an employee benefit working remote. Read articles where in herd have some employees moved because they figured it was remote work forever and they've moved further away from the city or even some people in other states. And then uh, people are being forced to come back into work. And of course they, they quit because they're given an ultimatum and they've already, like you said, made those lifestyle changes. Yeah. So, I think the 100% remote people, yeah, you did hear some of that where they made the assumption that it was going to be 100% remote forever. Maybe they were led to believe that, or maybe they leapt to a conclusion. <laughs> Either way, it doesn't seem like it was actually a reasonable conclusion to make. But, um, but yeah, they did hear some people move. Um, my own sister fell into that. Not in this is this is way pre-pandemic. Um, she was uh, laid off and uh, was with the railroad and it was it was deemed as probably permanent, but there was a callback potential. Okay. Well, she was out for eight years and hmm. then they called her back. Wow. Meanwhile, in eight years, she moved three hours away from her job, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, and so, but then, you know, she wanted, she did come back and she, you know, finished her, her time in order to, um, if she hadn't, you know, there would have been implications for her pension and all that, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, then she had to create a major commuting lifestyle of commuting down on Sunday nights and commuting back home again on Friday evenings. And, you know, there can be, uh, mm. serious penalties for making those kinds of decisions. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, now we've, so I wish I had the person uh, who asked the question one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two here. So we, you know, I, the first question I would want to ask the person is why? Why do you want to force your employees to come back in? Most of the time, or I would assume, because I've been through this before with some clients, uh, most of the time they want their employees to come back in for productivity reasons. And this is a, a true story. Um, there was during the pandemic, I actually had a client who was on the West Coast and uh, they were messaging me, you know, late at night. And it was after 10, my time, central time, but it's after eight, their time. And he was livid. He was going back and forth with uh, one of his lead engineers and said that he wanted them, the team to come into the office and, and at the, this was like the peak of, of COVID. So uh, I remember he, he said, James, I'm ready to fire this guy. And I said, why? And he said, well, well, you know, he and he and he's 
kind of speaking for the rest of the engineers. He said they don't want to come into the, the office for health reasons. And I don't think it's really them. He was kind of blaming it on the engineer's wife, which was interesting. But I just said, well, why is that so important to you? He goes, well, productivity, James. I know those guys are out. He was old school. He had a brick and mortar office. And he goes, I'm certain these guys are screwing off. I know the productivity has gone down. I said, well, let's look at your numbers. You know, right now, I pull up your service board. Let's take a look at what utilization is. And utilization was about the same. You know, it really hadn't moved. And I said, okay, well, that's a good sign. I go, let's look at the more important one. And I said, let's pull up your profit and loss statement. I want, I want to see what your uh, profit margins are. I want to see what your net income is and your service level income for this month compared to the the previous you know the trailing 12 months mm -hmm. and interestingly enough when we did that his net income was up 37 percent that month compared to the average of the previous 12 months and so i just said look i'm i'm just gonna have to tell you it's your productivity went up you're making more money uh your employees are probably happier my recommendation, and I'm sure you've come to the same conclusion, I would leave it alone. I wouldn't force anybody to come into the office because uh, people are going to quit. You know, when you give them ultimatums, normally, you know, it's it's a bad thing. Yeah, so, it doesn't yeah. matter what the ultimatum is. Just the fact that it's an ultimatum yeah, on bored. anything. They're being yeah. right. That will make that just makes people unhappy. And, I, I, you know, I think the, the studies now are pretty conclusive that um, that people are productive working remote. Mm -hmm. It's a different work pattern. The managers, the owners, they may feel uncomfortable about it, but it's mm -hmm. it's their own issue, right? Yeah. They need they need to retrain themselves to learn how to hold that corporate culture together, to learn how to manage remote workers, and exactly. you know, to uh, to to do to get over that feeling, right? <laughs> And we, we are tech companies, right? We set up all of our clients, yeah. you know, on, on how to be hybrid or remote workforce. And, you know, there's no reason why we can't do it ourselves. Amy and I have spoken quite extensively about the benefits of that, how to motivate and, and maintain that culture and motivate your employee performance remotely. We've talked a lot about that already. So mm -hmm. I don't want to rehash that. But something interesting that you brought up, you know, it's it's really an employee perk. And it kind of reminds me, there was an interesting article I read last week. It was really more around employee satisfaction as it pertains to benefits. What are they expecting today? And there were two key things that I remember vividly from the article. One is it did say the overwhelming majority of employees when surveyed prefer a hybrid type of uh, work environment where they have the option to come in or they have the option to work remote. And uh, so that's point number one. And something else, Amy, I thought was really interesting is it said the uh, overwhelming majority, or I think it was in the 60s, like mid 60s, not overwhelming majority, but majority of the people wanted to be paid weekly. <clears throat> it said not twice a month, not once a month. And us business owners kind of laugh because normally we get paid once a month. <laughs> But um, your employees want to get paid weekly. And, and their point was they were just saying that the normal employee today runs out of money. And I think they were saying like 12 days after they get paid, meaning they, they don't know how to work off of a budget. And, you know, they uh, maybe they need some personal finance coaching. That's what it sounds like to me. But yeah. what are your thoughts on, on that? That's interesting to me. Yeah, I... Um... I've only paid myself once a month for the last 20 years, you know, almost the whole time that I, that I had a business. Um, and I, I never, I was never a person that had trouble budgeting or trouble managing my money. I just tend to live below my means just sort of naturally. Like I don't feel I have to work at it. Right. Yep, um, that's and that's smart. always been the case, right. Even when I didn't make a lot of money, I didn't, I, I never felt, stressed by it right yeah um but i have to i wonder i mean we've, we've known for a long time right most people 
what are they? Most people are two paychecks away from bankruptcy or something. Yeah. yeah. And you know, they have less than less than a thousand dollars in the bank. Um, and I forget there's some other really scary statistic that it was a, a good good percentage of people, I'm not gonna say it's a majority, but it was a good percentage of people, Americans, um, could not put together five hundred dollars for an emergency. Wow. Like between between their savings, their free credit, their uh, you know, money coming from a paycheck that isn't going straight away to bills, they can't add all that stuff together and come up with five hundred bucks. Wow. Wow. And you know that that would stress me, right? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. the whole time I can I can see it on your face. Uh, listeners, you can't see James' face, but <laughs> James is just as stressed by that idea as I am. Like, oh my God, you know, to have things be that that tight that you know your car breaks down and you you can't put the five hundred bucks together to get it fixed. I mean, it, you can spiral in a hurry. Yes. So yeah, I agree. I think people do do need some personal finance uh, education. Um, but paying every week is, um, I just wonder if that isn't part of the subscription economy that we have today, mm -hmm. right? Because those subscription, subscription bills keep coming. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder if that's part of, part of what maybe is, is driving that we need to get paid more frequently. It's good. A good point. It makes it more challenging to budget your money when you've got all these subscriptions dinging your, your account uh, on a monthly basis because it, it doesn't all happen on the first of the month. It happens at random days throughout the month. So yeah, yeah, I and, think and that's going to be part of it. People yeah. people don't like to budget. They're the whole, just the word alone gives them stress. Like you know, I shouldn't have to budget. Well, the whole everybody in the whole world has to budget. Like there's probably just a couple of people out there in the in the billions area that maybe don't have to budget, mm -hmm. but um, the re rest of us all do have to be. I have to keep an eye on what it is that what it is that we're spending. Uh, did I think this is this might be a uniquely American problem? I mean, if we have any listeners outside the U.S., they can maybe um, back me up on this or tell me I'm wrong. But I'm pretty sure that I read that in a lot of Europe that the normal pay scale pay rate is once a month. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., I'm going to say it's probably two weeks or twice a month. I know I always paid my employees twice a month. Right. And there was a point I asked them about, you know, switching, how they would feel about switching to once a month. And there was, there was a resounding, absolutely not, right? <laughs> <laughs> the concept no. of having, the concept of having to budget through a whole month was something they didn't feel they could handle. Yeah. So I know, so I never changed it, right? We did, we did twice a month. Um, well, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I guess I, I, I worry a little bit about people that can't feel, feel that they can't see their way to figure out how to budget their way through a two week period. Just two weeks isn't a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, Amy, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. Um, uh, Read several of his books, listened to his programs, and um, I actually is that the guy that screams a lot on television? He, he, no, I think uh, I think that's uh, Kramer. Um, oh, okay. But he, maybe he does. Uh, but he's he's more of a conservative person that I think does a great job of teaching personal finance and personal finance. You know, I, I grew up. I know I had some personal finance classes in high school. I was a business major, so I had personal finance for sure in in college. And it's old school. I'm going to age myself and, you know, teach you the basic things like how to balance uh, your checkbook, you know, how to uh, how to create a budget, a personal budget for yourself and, you know, how to buy insurance and, uh, you know, are credit cards good or bad, that type of thing. I'll tell you the uh, you know, went through the, the schooling, that was always good. But if anybody is interested in taking a free personal finance class, take a look, just Google Dave Ramsey's uh, financial piece. It's called financial piece. I think it's a nine part 
series that a lot of local nonprofits, a lot of churches will will do it for free for local people. And you could sign up for the class. I think if you want the courseware, it's like $80, but it's really, really good. And I actually went through that class uh, as a family. I, I had both my boys go through it when they were younger. And we just had it like as a family date. It was like every Wednesday uh, evening. And then we'd go out to dinner afterwards, but it really reinforced some of the things that we talked about. And uh, anyway, I can't say enough good things about that program, but I remember one of the stats that was terrifying to me is 72% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So yeah. that speaks right back to your point of, you know, uh, you know, the weekly, you know, if they get paid weekly, that that's better. So, uh, anyway. yeah, but it doesn't really solve the problem though, does it? No, no. It, it just, it helps them helps them not have to think about it. A, there is a kind of a, a notion out there that you shouldn't have to think about these things. It makes people uncomfortable, but you do have to think about it. it interesting to me that you had a finance class in high school. Um, I did not. And, um, uh, but my, you know, my parents taught me, my mother specifically, she yeah. was the, she was the money person in the house and, okay. You know, as a kid, I had a savings account with the savings book and, you know, you had to write down what your deposit was and add and subtract yeah. and do all that stuff. <laughs> and then same thing, you know, when I when I got a, a checking account, you know, she sat down and taught me how to balance a checkbook. And, um, you know, and then, yeah, throughout, you know, just throughout growing up with my mom, she would have us do different things, you know, save up to buy something. And, uh, you know, so you get that reward at the end for, for doing your, your savings. Right. And um, with my parents, what would happen is I would be just, you know, diligently focused on saving up for this thing I wanted. And um, I would get halfway there and they'd be like, oh, you, you, you know, that's, you did, you did, did really well, you know, here's the other half. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. then we go out and get the thing. And, uh, that actually became a, a little bit of a pattern. I realized that if I saved half, my parents would kick in the other half. Right? <laughs> oh, there you go. That was smart. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I, um, I guess you know, I, I have viewed that not as a, a thing that our public schools should necessarily be teaching, because man, there's so many things that we ask them to teach these days. Right. Um, and if the pandemic taught us one thing, it's that we're also expecting them to be our daycare solution. Right. <laughs> but because uh, that was the biggest gripe. But um, yeah, to to put that uh, put that on them, I you know, I guess I I learned it from my parents, so I would think people would be learning it from their parents. But I know that certainly doesn't always happen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, it's an interesting topic. And and actually, we'd love to hear uh, questions like this from you guys. So if you've got a question, go ahead and submit it on the smbcommunitypodcast.com website or just email me, james at kernanconsulting.com. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so great question. Thank you for that. And um, there was a couple other things I wanted to talk about. So we're going to run out of time, but there were some really interesting articles. One that I saw this past week was Enable's CEO put out an article. It was called the Enable 2024 MSP Challenges and Opportunities. And it was an article through channel uh, ete.com. And it wasn't really anything earth shattering. It's, you know, the cyber, you know, cybersecurity trends, um, you know, talked about AI, talked about RMM, talked about um, lots of merger acquisition, all the stuff that we talk about on this program. So nothing really stood out to me. They talked about some of the challenges uh, people are having out there as well. But I thought that was very insightful uh, to kind of reinforce some of the topics Amy and I have been chatting about. So I'm going to drop that in the show notes, uh, check that out. And then there was another article that I thought was interesting too. It was called how the top MSP business owners are using AI in their business. And it was uh, a CRN article, Computer Reseller News, but CRN.com. I'll drop the link out there, but they interviewed the top 10 or, or 
most successful or larger MSP business owners. And I'd heard of most of them before, but uh, of what they were doing with AI in their business. And most of them at a high level were using it like in their help desk for more of a knowledge base for their engineers or their technicians to respond faster. Uh, some of them were using AI in marketing and in their sales process. Uh, but I thought that was another interesting um, article as well to, you know, the more successful MSPs, I think they were kind of being lifted up on a pedestal a little bit, but what they were doing with AI. So um, it's early days, early days for AI. Um, I've been playing with, with several AI uh, solutions as well. Maybe we can talk about that um, in an episode coming up, what solutions that, that you and I are using. Right. Um, I've been poking at them quite a bit. I find gen in general, I find them all kind of incomplete and, and I'm always left disappointed, but there's some, <laughs> there's some good things about them as well, right? They, so they do some things, but they don't do everything that I expect them to do anyway. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. That's we can talk about point. that. We can talk about that in a, in a future episode and um, I'll tell you guys which ones that, that I'm finding useful. Um, I'll give you one of, there's, where's one that's made its way into my everyday use and it's actually just a search engine. Um, it's called perplexity. Uh, so if you want to go check it out and they're interestingly, they're not using the open eye large language model. They have, um, they're using some open source large language models, several of them to put together to, um, to run, run their search engine. So um, check out perplexity.io and uh, we'll talk more about AI in future episodes. If you want to send us an MP3, tell us your victories, your challenges, your, your defeats, or even pose a question for us to discuss, just go to smbcommunitypodcast.com and fill out the form, submit your questions, comments, and so forth, and give us your MP3. Hey there, this is James Kernan with Kernan Consulting, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the Mastermind Peer Groups. So with the Mastermind Peer Groups, you get a powerful combination of customized coaching, accountability, and weekly synergy sessions with like-minded professionals from all around North America. These peer groups are really focused on sales, marketing, and growth. It's all about results. So I am your personal group facilitator. I facilitate all of the groups. You'll experience weekly accountability meetings, monthly trainings, and then quarterly face-to-face -face meetings where we all get together on a quarterly basis in fun cities all around America. So be prepared to take your business to new heights and see if you've got what it takes to be one of the Mastermind Peer Group members. Thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to interview Fernando Leon, who's the VP of Sales and Marketing for a really cool company. I'm sure many of you have heard of them before, but it's called Single Point of Contact. And what these guys do is it's really a white label overlay IT platform that helps MSPs scale and grow and make more money. And who doesn't want to learn about that? This is this is right up my alley. So, uh, Fernando, hey, welcome to the program. Hey, hey, James, thanks for uh, having me on today. Cool. So you guys have a, a unique service, and I love these white label services because for all the listeners that know me, I'm a big fan of the, the white label providers because it's all about us helping you, the MSP business owner, grow your brand, right? And that's exactly what you guys do. So I was looking forward to talking with you guys today. But before I do that, let, tell me a little bit about your background. You know, how did you stumble into this and how long have you been at it? Well, I've been in the IT industry for almost three decades. I started off working for the big firms with Xerox, networking their uh, clients they supported. Um, Amdahl was a big uh, yeah. provider of uh, servers and mainframes. And then I went into the startup world, and that's where I met the founder of Single Point of Contact. And I've been at Single Point of Contact for 20 three years now. Wow. Wow. 
Yeah. So we've been around. We've been around for a while. <laughs> so yeah. quite a quite a history there. Cool. So tell us a little bit more about. Uh, I, I can see from your guys' website, my understanding, you know, obviously it's a, it's an IT platform. You provide OEM services for help desk, managed IT, and SOC. I mean, everybody needs help there, you know, so they can scale. But can you go a little deeper? Help, help me understand your offering. Sure. So we're competing with organizations that offer platforms that provide them with all the software. They demand you be on their on their platform, so IT organizations don't have that flexibility. We yep. provide you with that flexibility. We'll use your tools, or we can provide you with all the entire tech stack, right? RMM, backup, documentation, everything. But what makes us unique is that we will work with IT firms' um, uh, uh, tech stack, whatever they uh, have in place. We're, we don't force anybody to rip anything out. We want to be really? able to deliver that service that they desperately need because they don't have the bandwidth. And it's it can be a challenge to scale, manage people, hire people, and then you have to manage them. So we get rid of all of that. So Yeah, that's awesome. That's music to my ears. I love that you're, you know... Um... Uh, tool ag agnostic where you let people use their own tools. I, I can't tell you, I've been coaching and consulting MSPs for 17 years. <laughs> and one of the questions I hear all the time from, from people, business owners are, Hey, can you help me switch from this CRM platform to another one or this PSA to another, or this RMM to another? It's like, no, yeah. no. <laughs> I always try to talk them out of it first because they waste so much time and energy you know, jumping from one to the other. And yeah. um, anyway, that's a whole nother program in itself. But uh, so love what you guys do. Give me give me an example client of like, how long does it take to onboard and, and what do you provide for them and how has that helped them grow? Uh, great question, because that comes up in every discussion with our clients. How long will it take to onboard us? To onboard the, the actual IT firm doesn't take very long. Because we just got to go through some uh, documentation we need to sign. We then go over their inventory of documents they have, they may need, because we provide our clients with all the documentation you need to operate an MSP. Then they say, well, how long is it going to take to onboard my client? Well, it just depends. Is it a five-person office or a 500-person office? What are, we, what are we implementing? Are we integrating our tools? Are your tools in place? So it all depends on the scope, but typically uh, a 500 person office would probably take less than a, than a month to implement, get the team trained, get documentation in place, uh, uh, you know, get workflows in place. Workflows are very uh, important because we got to fully understand what our team needs to do in the event that, oh, there's a power outage. Okay, who do we call? Who do we, who's the power off? You know, who's the power company? Right. All those numbers. So, yeah. Yep, no, I, I know how complex that onboarding can be. So oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that's moving at light speed. Um, yes. So good, good work on that. So, you know, you've been at this for a long time and you provide an overlay service. And I know you've got, you, you've been in the industry, the channel for a long time. What how have things changed from your perspective? What kind of trends are you seeing? Um, you know, where, where's the opportunity out there for people? Security. Security is at the forefront. Mm -hmm. AI has become so uh, an integral part in security because it does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. And tools like Splunk, Sentinel One, CrowdStrike, they all work together to ensure the client is not only secure, but compliant. And we, we also implement compliant tools. So we ensure they stay compliant each month. But um, there's a number of layers we implement to ensure clients are not only secure, but they stay compliant. MFA is big right now. Multi-factor authentication right. is so huge. But file it like file integrity monitoring. We don't want Tom and marketing accessing HR files that has no, he has no, uh, business looking into. So we want to make sure that file structures are secure and people who aren't supposed to be accessing information shouldn't be accessing. So yeah, there, there, there's, there's a lot to it. 
I mean, I, I'm 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 a I'm a sales and marketing guy. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I got <laughs> I got I got engineers for that. <laughs> they can sure, sure. they can talk your ear off, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're you're super experienced and uh, you're selling yourself short. I know you're uh, you're very very intelligent. Uh, you guys are, are running a tight ship, so that's awesome. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on the security side. Security is everything, and yeah. if you're not a security minded MSP, you're in big trouble because yeah. you're going to get beat out on on every deal that's coming down the pipe for you um, unless you you change that. So I love that you guys are offering the 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 white label sock, you know, the white label managed IT. So if you're listening and you're a struggling MSP, you don't have the ability to have the tools and have the security engineer talent on your team, you could white label it through uh, through their their organization. I mean, that that's what you guys are all about. I love that. Um, okay, well, that's off, awesome. Do you guys have a... Um, is there any kind of offers going on? Uh, any any specials that would motivate someone to to sign up for a demo or or to give you guys a call? Well, one of the biggest um, I think one of the biggest benefits that's always offered to all of our IT clients, <laughs> and I'm I'm shocked that a lot of them don't take advantage of it because um, it's probably one of the most important components in a business is marketing. We, we have marketing down. We know the formula of what it takes to be, to generate uh, new opportunities every month. Mm -hmm. And we offer that at no cost. When you're our, when you're our client, we want to help you build your business. We want it to grow. I mean, it brings in more business for us, but it also brings in a lot more business for you and more opportunities. And, we always offer that. I mean, I think that is is probably invaluable to many of our our IT clients. A lot of them take advantage of it. I've helped yeah. them build PPC campaigns, SE, implement SEO campaigns, email marketing campaigns. But don't I? I don't know if you would be shocked, James, but ninety nine percent of the IT firms we work with do not market themselves. They rely on word of mouth, and if yeah. that's you. I, I want to help you. We want to help you guys. We even give them money. James, we'll even give them money. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. Sign me up. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Never have enough. No, that's awesome. And and you bring up a good point. I mean, I've been coaching and consulting for 17 years and sales and marketing has always been easy for me. That's just how I was yep. programmed getting in the industry way back when. But uh, it is all about sales and marketing. And time and time again, when you read the industry predictions or what's the biggest, what's the number one issue MSP business owners have, it's, you know, net new leads. They want net new logos. How do I get a first time appointment with a prospect yep. that is, is a good fit for me? That's the number one thing. So it's all about marketing. Yep. So uh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Tell everybody, how can people get in touch with you guys? How can they learn more about your offering? Well, they can go to our website, singlepointoc.com, or you can email me at sales at singlepointoc.com. Okay. And I'm happy to walk them through a demo, a SOC demo, our RMM tools, our dashboards. We we give them lots of uh of uh, information so they can make an educated decision because it's a big, this type of partnership is critical to the success of an organization. All right. Well, hey, I enjoyed having you on today, Fernando. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sign off. But again, we'd love to hear from you. Any questions that you would have submit MSP question of the week, uh, send it on over to us and we would love to share that on the program. So uh, good chatting with you, Amy. We'll catch up with you next week. See you next week, James. Today's SMB Community Podcast is brought to you by Huntress Managed Security. Cybersecurity is more than software. It's about the expertise needed to effectively fight today's evolving threat landscape. Huntress Managed Security is custom-built to provide human expertise 
and save your clients from cyber threats. Huntress's suite of fully managed cybersecurity solutions is powered by a 24-7 human-led SOC dedicated to around-the-clock monitoring, expert investigation, and rapid response. While you focus on growing your business, we provide first response to hackers. Huntress has the number one rated EDR for SMBs on G2 and a partner support satisfaction score average of 99%. To start a trial today, visit Huntress.com carl.